We're grateful to be back with everybody tonight and have heard a good lesson concerning more than conquerors. Appreciate Brett's efforts on that. And we want to continue with our study of the life of Abraham and many of the things that pertain to him and why inspiration chose him to be in the scriptures in the first place. There may be various reasons it chose him. Uh, we Notice that in we in introducing him that we pointed out that in Genesis that when you uh, study his life, you see that it um, unfolds itself naturally in five uh, movements, if you would call it that. And last week at the end of the class, I was looking at the third one, the we'll say periods, the movement, the third period that covers uh, Genesis uh, 15 and 16. We were in the process of, of looking at that. And there's one thing I want to go back over because in going back through the lesson, I noticed that I, when I was referring you to Hebrews 7 about Melchizedek, I then referred you and I meant to say Galatians and I said Genesis. And uh, Paul, by inspiration, used Abraham two different times in Genesis 3. I did it again, Galatians 3 and 4. So you might want to take note of that. Both case, That whole book, of course, deals so much with refuting the Judaizing teachers in the church. And both of those actually set forth um, uh, points that have to be understood, need to be understood as to realizing that Christ has all authority and we approach God only through him and that Moses uh, is not at all involved as far as establishing the authority that uh, makes people Christians and keeps us faithful in the church. So I just wanted to mention that. We were involved in the third period, as I said, and um, God was, I'll, I'll back up and go back over some of it, but God was explaining to Abraham that his descendants uh, would be enslaved or in bondage in a strange land. <clears throat> They would come out of that land in the fourth generation. And at that time, they would return to Canaan. Um, the boundaries of that land, Canaan, for his descendants was um, identified. As you read through this part of Genesis, It basically identifies just simply the land or the boundaries by the inhabitants of the land at the time that Abraham was there. Now, as I said also last week, he had been there for a few years, maybe 10, uh, but he has no child of his own. And here's where we came into the business of where um, Sarah made the suggestion, as we mentioned last week, that they would, there would be a son born to her handmaid in Abraham, handmaid being Hagar. And this is where you get into chapter uh, three uh, and see how it's employed in the book of Galatians. And I think I won't go into that right now, but there it is, Galatians 3. I believe it begins in about verse 22, where he says this is an allegory and explains it to you. We would know, by the way, that this is an allegory unless the Holy Spirit by Paul told us it was. As far as we're concerned here in the book of Genesis, it's just simply the history of Abraham. And of course, remember, this is the beginning of the unfolding, the scheme of redemption down through the stream of time and the people that were involved in what they were doing. Now, I think all of us would curiosity would like to know what else was going on around them uh, they didn't live in a vacuum they lived among all the other peoples of that time just like we don't live in a vacuum as christians but we live in our society and culture wherever that may be whether it's in the united states or some other part of the world but the lord's not interested in that and that's one of the peculiarities of the bible that makes it special it is god's word but it unfolds the scheme of redemption to the salvation of man through Christ, to the glory of God the Father. If you want to think of a one line uh, summation of the Bible, there it is. And in doing so, he shows you that it was done in history. It's not some fantastic thing. It actually happened among 
ordinary human beings as far as them being like every other human. And uh, we find out then, as we discussed a little bit last week, that that uh, this was a mistake on their part. But I emphasized last week, and I want to emphasize it again, when you sit down and think about the limited amount, uh, limited amount of revelation that Abraham and Sarah had concerning just exactly how, that is the particulars of how God's going to save man, how even he's going to make of Abraham a great nation, that's, uh, that is not clear to him as it's clear to us. So let me drive a peg down here again. As you study the word of God, you have to try to realize how much does he know about this? It's like when you read about David extolling the law of God, commandments, how wonderful all that is. Well, just how much of the Bible did David have? He probably, well, we know he had what we call the Pentateuch, five-fold volume, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Probably he had, no doubt he had Joshua and Judges. Maybe Second Samuel. That's David's Bible. So when he talks about that, he's basically talking about the parts of the Pentateuch that talk about the law of Moses. Because that's what he was under as a Jew. So we don't need to think that David had the insights that we do regarding all the rest of the Old Testament and how marvelous the perfect law of liberty is. He didn't. He never had any of those things. You could talk to Abraham and the patriarchal age and David or anybody else at that time who uh, was under the uh, Mosaic system. And you could talk about the Lord's Supper all you wanted to, and they wouldn't know what in the world you're talking about. You could talk about baptism for the remission of sins. They don't know anything about that. And uh, it's going to be hundreds of years, hundreds of years before anybody does. So we have to look at it from the standpoint of where they are at the time the Bible discusses them and what they knew and abraham was really very limited in what he knew so before we criticize sarai too fast about saying well here i am as old as i am you're old as you are and uh, how's this going to happen maybe we can help it out anyway she suggested that and abraham did it he listened to her and thus you have ishmael born uh, no Nothing's in the Bible that says that Abraham didn't love him. In fact, it's quite to the contrary. He loved him very much. And he thought that God would surely work out the covenant through Ishmael. But he didn't. And this leads us then to the fourth period in Abraham's life. Genesis chapter 17 through 21. Genesis chapter 17 through 21. And again, as we said, uh, in each one of these periods, God appears to Abraham. And notice he's 99 years old. And he said, you're going to sire a son. <laughs> so you can see why they might be wondering, do we need to step in here and help matters out? I might back up and say this about uh, Sarai recommending her handmaid. You know that Jesus in Matthew 19, at that time, restored marriage in the home as it was in the beginning. Well, then what's going on here? It's obvious that God's allowing and permitting things and did for hundreds of years thereafter, uh, such as the multiplicity of lives, uh, lie, I get it in a minute, wives. And... Um, also handmaidens at this time. And so this was nothing that they thought any different of. It wasn't something that shocked them. So this is the way it worked. But now on into what we have in 17 through 21. So he's 99 years old. And Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. So 13 years have gone by. 
that's how much older Ishmael is and, and a little older than that, than Isaac. But what mainly comes out of this is, is that God explained very clearly to Abram that the covenant would not be worked out through Ishmael, but it would be through a child of Abram and Sarai. So God promised that he would bless Ishmael. We won't pursue that, except that he is the father of the Arabs. The promise will be fulfilled through Isaac. I want to make a, a point here that gets overlooked sometimes. I think we all know it, but I want to emphasize it. Here, because people would not wait on God, as good as they were for people serving God in the patriarchal age, they wouldn't wait on him. They were thinking, just like a lot of humans would think, how old they are, how are we going to have a child, and so on. And what happens is that we see God, well, let's, let me put it around the other way. We see Abraham showing really uh, somewhat of a weaker faith here than what we normally think of Abraham. And again, and he should have learned this from Adam and Eve, he listened to his wife. She thought it up, and she told him. So God promised that he would bless Ishmael. He became a great nation, and lo and behold, if you read Galatians chapter Three, you'll see that uh, the one that was born of the bondmaid became the one who persecuted the free woman. Now, I know that we're under the Christian dispensation. Christ has all authority. The New Testament is where that authority is presented, and we all become Christians, and spiritual Israel exists today that the Jews who inhabit Israel or wherever they are today, the modern state of Israel, they're no special people as a great many people think they are, still God's chosen. They are not. But ethnically, the Arabs descending from Ishmael, half-brother in the flesh, Isaac, are still at war with the descendants. What's the point? Just one birth has plunged the world into all kinds of problems to this present hour. Why is the situation like it is in the Middle East? You're reading the origin of it right here. Somebody said that uh, here's what happens when the Ladies' Aid Society gets mixed up in it won't wait on God. Well, that's not saying women don't have good sense, not saying women don't have good advice, not say, saying that women don't have good counsel. But this one time they should have waited on God. Sometimes we want things to be done on our timetable. And we try to look at things as we do anything else. But God's involved in our life. We're his children. The Bible's full of material that says God will take care of you. God will provide on the basis of your seeking first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. He'll take care of you. But sometimes we try to take care of things suit ourselves. It might remind you that it doesn't take but one birth to plunge the world into thousands of years of trouble. Just one birth. It only won, it only took a couple of bites out of a fruit that was forbidden by God to plunge the whole world until the day the Lord comes back into this mess it's in today. Why are these things written in the Bible? Well, there's a lesson. Oh, written a four times for our learning, Paul says, Romans 15, 4. The question is, do we learn? A great many people who are members of the church who might criticize Sarah and Abraham for what they did through Hagar and then Ishmael being born. 
do the same things with their lives. Well, I just don't know how to do this. I just don't have the wherewithal to do it. Now to think of Moses who said, I, I can't speak. I can't this. I can't that. Moses just needed to say, well, God has called me to do it. He wouldn't call me, have called me to do it if I couldn't do it. And we ought to have the attitude of, well, I never have, but I can. I don't know that a lot of us think about that where well, we are. doesn't mean everybody's going to be of the same ability and accomplishment, but it does mean we must learn to wait on God. If God promised something. It was for me. And if God said that he would provide for us, if we put him first, he will. Some of us think we're acting by faith when we're really acting by looking at our own bank account. We can see what's in it. We just don't know how in the world anything else is going to work out. Well, if you're serving God faithfully, remember we're more than conquerors. If you're serving God faithfully, he can make it all work out. I don't have to know. Any more than Abraham Sarah, I had to know. So there's so many lessons. This is just one I'm spending a lot of time on because it has a bearing on our everyday service to God in the church and just what it is to be faithful to the Lord through the teaching of the New Testament and doing what he's called us to do. That's why that you have be ready unto every good work. Of course, the work. Is set out and authorized by God. We're to be ready unto everything, opportunities. So this is one thing that comes out, but it must be according to the will of heaven. And if God's promised it to us, he can bring it about. And if God's promised, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto us, they will be. Yeah, but I don't. Well, that's like a faith when you say that. You're looking for, uh, you might say that's, that, that's looking for Hagar. To help out with the promise God made to Abraham that through thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, and I'll make of thee a great nation. Well, let's pursue this further. Maybe we didn't beat that over the head too much, but it's a great lesson. And it's there in the patriarchal age, and it's explored over and over again and applied in different ways throughout the rest of the Bible, especially for us of the church. So God again promised that I will give uh, unto thee. And to thy seed, singular, after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Genesis 17, verse 8. Uh, I would say this about everlasting. Many people, and sometimes it does mean eternal, but many times everlasting means in the duration of, that I want it to be, such as the law of Moses being an everlasting covenant. Well, everlasting covenant, as long as God wants to be binding, doesn't mean eternal. And here it doesn't mean that this is uh, means that this, uh, the children of Israel would always possess the land of Canaan. We know when we get further over into the Old Testament and under the time the Jews are there, how much they displeased God and their continual sin, and God took it away from them. And so we ought to have to understand some of those things about the use of certain terms. So God now changes the name of Abram to Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And he changes the name of Sarai to Sarah. Well, as we move on with the narration, we see that certain messengers, we might call them divine messengers, come to visit Abraham. And the text simply brings out when he saw them coming, he thought they were just human beings coming. And again, they explain that Sarah would have a son. This is when you remember she's, He's dropping by the tent flap, and she laughs and then tries to deny it when she's caught. But these messengers from God are going to destroy 
the city of cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the others like them on the plain. And he did so. Now, the word angel comes in here, and angel strictly, angelos in the Greek, strictly means a spirit being who's a messenger. It can be used to mean just a messenger. Anybody that's carrying a message could be called an angel. With the various views people have of angels nowadays, I need to mention that because in general, anybody with a message to carry to somebody else's is an angelos. In this case, they're called angels because they are messengers. The divine messengers. And we won't go back through all of the bargaining that Abraham did with God, who, by the way, uh, there were four of those messengers and three of them going toward, um, I believe I got my numbers right, and three of them going toward uh, Solomon. Uh, but we find one remaining and he's addressed as Lord. So they go on and destroy those cities, we're not getting into detail because we're studying Abraham. It was their going to those cities that enabled Lot and his daughters to escape. Lot's wife, remember, became disobedient and looked back when they were told not to, and she became a pillar of salt. But now we move through that episode. We go back more zeroing in on Abraham, and we see Isaac was born. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Sarah was 90 years old. And this was 25 years after the great promise was first made to Abraham, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now, serious, I think I can use the word serious in saying serious strife developed Abraham's household. And uh, Sarah demanded, cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son. Now, it's interesting that the first time around that Sarah had suggested Hagar to be the one through whom they would help God perform that promise that they would have a son. And, you know, they answered all that. But now, you doesn't want him around. You know, that makes uh, Ishmael somewhere around 14 years old when he's just a baby or when he was born. And it is made very clearly after she says that, that God instructs Abraham to do what Sarah suggested for him to do. I think it's interesting that he resisted this time when she suggested it, and it took God telling him to do it before he embraced it. And he says, hearken unto her voice, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And then God said concerning Ishmael, I will make him a great nation. Um, Ishmael dwelt in what's called the land of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt, and the Arabs were on the way. And they're still on their way. Now that ends that portion. Notice I said, each time in Abraham's life, you can begin these different periods by God revealing himself and having a message for him. Now we come to the fifth period found in Genesis 22, all the way through chapter 25, verse 11. Genesis 22, verses 25, verse 11. Now, when uh, at this time, when Isaac was 25 years old, now you notice how we've jumped a long way as far as the inspired narrative is concerned. And Moses sitting here writing this and the Holy Spirit inspiring him, just like Paul was inspired of the Holy Spirit in writing the New Testament, his part in the New Testament and any other writers of the Bible. You're not interested in just giving a day-to-day -day detail of what they did. He's interested in hitting the points that are important to the unfolding of the scheme of redemption. 
This again reminds us that the Bible is not put here strictly to be a history. It is through history revealing God's scheme of redemption. So it hits on those things in that way. Now, our curiosity does me anyway. Many times um, says, I'd like to know more about the detailed activity of these folks, their day-to-day -day work and so forth. But that's not why this is written. He says, take now thy son, speaking to Abraham, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Genesis 22, 2. Now, the thing that stands out here is how much faith has grown in Abraham from the time he was told when he was back in, in Ur of the Chaldees to get out of his country, go to a place God would show him, get away from his people. This is one of those great tests of faith, and it was a hard test. I don't think anybody can say it was not a, a hard test. It was a very difficult thing as far as his confidence in God, his trust in God, his belief in God, his trust in God's word, and so on. But when you read the text, there's simply no doubting on the part of Abraham. When he's told to do this, he just simply gets up early the next morning. That'd been one morning, he'd be easy to sleep late. He got up early the next morning, made off toward the mountain, mountains, mountains of Moriah. Um, he had had various tests. The first one, telling him to leave his kindred, was, was a pretty good test. Just to get out and go. Well, where am I going? I'll tell you later. You just get up and go. Leave all your people. So he's growing. I, I wish we would realize that when we're old enough to understand the truth and know we sin and need a savior and Christ is our savior and we know the terms of pardon and we know that we need to be baptized having believed in Christ for the remission of sins, that uh, if we grow like we ought to through study and prayer, and application of truth to our lives, once we've risen from the water and grave of baptism and a, a new creature in Christ, I wish we'd realize that we're going to grow and know and have deeper insights. I've seen a whole host of people all my preaching days who look back on what they knew at the time that they were baptized and realize they know so much more about a lot that pertains to godly living in the church, and they begin to doubt that they knew enough when they were baptized. Well, I'm certainly not saying that you don't need to know certain things before you're qualified to be scripturally baptized. But I am saying that you can't expect to grow if you stay faithful. You have to in knowledge and practice of what it is to be a Christian. And again, you have to give yourself time. Of course, that time must be properly used. But think of Abraham. And there it is. It was properly used. He made some mistakes, but nevertheless, he he always was going the right direction. Just mark that down. He was always going the right direction. So Abraham builds an altar, and he lays wood on it, and he bound Isaac, and he laid him on the wood. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. How old is Isaac right now? Five years old? He's a grown man, as we would say. So while this focus is on testing Abraham's faith, confidence, and trust in God and his word, you realize how cooperative Isaac had to be for this to take place. So he binds Isaac. And you remember Isaac even asked, where, where's the sacrifice? And what's Abraham's response? God will provide. Now that sounds like me, Abraham's grown considerably in his own faith, but it still teaches us what I spent some time on a few minutes ago. God will take care of his part. Our concern ought to be 
taking care of our own part and quit second guessing him. So he lays the wood on him, stretches out his hand. He has the knife in his hand to slay his son. And he was in the very act of doing so. But what happened? Well, I don't think we can describe the great joy that must have come on Abraham <laughs> and, you know, upon Isaac too. When they heard that voice of God calling from out of heaven, saying, lay not thine hand upon the land, neither do anything unto him. For now I know thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Of course, God did provide a burnt offering. And Abraham calls this place Jehovah Jireh. You know what it means? What we've been emphasizing, the Lord has provided. Why was it right for Abraham to offer his son? There's only one reason. That's what God told him to do. And he is a faithful man, so he sets about to do it. Now, it's interesting to note that he says, now I know. This God's omniscient, he knew, he knew exactly what Abraham was going to do. This is for Abraham's benefit. Sometimes we don't realize just how strong our faith is or how weak our faith is. It will put to the test. Remember Peter? Peter thought his faith was a strong faith that was put to the test, and then he found out it wasn't. So we need to realize these are not uh, just picked out as random things to talk about or to tell about, and God just wrote it down, but they're there to show why these people are selected and what they were and examples for each one of us. And again, here you find God uh, giving the great covenant and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And he, he said, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Well, he never did actually kill his son, but you know that God's word is saying in his heart he had done so. And if God had not stayed his hand, he certainly would in reality have done so. Well, following that great lesson, we have then in the book the record of the death of Sarah. She died in um, Hebron. She was 127 years old. Now, I think it's interesting to note that Abraham continued to have children with his other, uh, other wives. It's been very interesting. Not much said about it, but that's what happened. He buries her in a burial place he obtained from the sons of Heth. And he buried her in the cave of Machpelah. Chapters 24 and 25 uh, actually record the closing days of Abraham. And that's where we learn about these other wives and children, our wife and children. And you see that Provisions were made, which is another interesting story, to, for the marriage of Isaac. Rebecca, of course, would be his, his wife. And he himself, as I say, married Keturah. And he made sure that his inheritance, all that he had, would go to Isaac. And Abraham dies at 175 years old. And it's interesting that he's buried by Isaac and Ishmael in that same cave, the cave of Machpelah. Now, all these things raise questions in my mind that my curiosity would like to know how close did Isaac and Ishmael remain that they would come together to bury their father. Well, you all have to remember that the world, as far as population is concerned, is so very small. A lot of people, but not anywhere near like we think about it today. Not at all. 
So we come to the end of the narration of this. And I, I'd like, as I said, when we started this, I'd like to pursue the same course we did with, uh, with Adam in the study of Abraham and see if we can notice some lessons that can be learned from him more than what I've already brought out as we went through the narrative. I guess the biggest thing that we can emphasize about Abraham, because that's what inspiration in the New Testament uh, noted Abraham for, and that is his great, strong, wonderful faith. His faith caused him to move as God directed him. So he left his homeland. And he left because God told him to do that. And when, when he traveled, this gets overlooked. When he traveled, he traveled as God directed him. We've already seen I was willing to offer his son because he was so instructed. I referred to you already as I think anybody in this group knows it went through the class on Hebrews that Hebrews chapter 11, he's cited by inspiration as being one of the marvelous examples of faith. I said this several times in reading through Hebrews. Um, if you want to see how we should benefit from the Old Testament, whether it's the patriarchal age or the Mosaic age, see how inspiration reached back in the Old Testament and use these people in the writing of the New Testament to teach us the importance of obeying Christ. And that's what we have in Hebrews 11. Remember, everybody in Hebrews 11 is cited as one with great faith. But the point is, none of them knew a thing in the world about the New Testament. And yet they had such great faith, and they had nothing like we had. The highest uh, spiritual code there is is the New Testament. They didn't have a bit of it, but look how faithful they were. And just keep in mind, Abraham knew nothing about the law of Moses, no thing to worry about. So that's important to understand. Now, what does that say for us? Well, we must be people who are directed by faith as God directed Abraham. If we're not, we simply will not go to heaven. It's that simple. Thus, Paul says that uh, we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 7. And that's because we understand that faith is formed in us by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Thus, we must not go beyond or fall short of or seek to change God's will. I cite simply 2 John 9 on that point. That whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, or he that does so hath God. He that abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he does not have a father or the son. We live in an age that doesn't respect doctrine, that doesn't respect the Bible, that doesn't respect the authority of the Bible. There's always been a lot of people like that, but more so now than what we've known in this nation in the past 200 years. But nobody's going to be a Christian if they do not respect the authority of God and the Bible and handle right the truth if they study it. You're just not going to, because there's no way for that faith to be formed in you properly if you have a wrong concept, a wrong understanding, a wrong division of the Bible. In other words, your faith in God can't be right if your knowledge of God's word is not right. It's that simple. And yet it's seemingly one of the hardest things to get across to people. We're going to run out of time here in a second. So rather than start in the next thing, I'm going to, to call it quits here and I'll have a word of prayer before we end, anybody have any questions or anything? We'll have a minute or so after that. So would you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we approach thee again, thankful for these good words that keep us mindful of the importance of having us self the Lord for all we believe and all we practice. 
Help us to walk uprightly before thee and walk in the faithful steps of Abraham, being faithful in all things. Thy name's honor and glory. May we so do it. Bless the church, be with the spring congregation. Help us to teach the truth and defend the faith. Feed us and even raise us up in good. Go with us on through life. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Anybody have any questions?